Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to this week's podcast. Summertime is upon us, and whenever I have to shoot these in the summer, I usually crank the AC up so it's pretty cold, then shoot this whole podcast, obviously with the AC off, so you don't have to hear the roaring in the background, and then turn it back on again. So I guess we'll play that lovely game called Let's See How Sweaty Bob Gets in this one. <laughs> oh, sorry, I'll, uh, I'll try to keep myself in check, but uh, yeah, happy summertime, everybody who's in the, the upper hemisphere of the world, and let's jump into the retro gaming news of the week. We're going to start this week with a whole bunch of news on the new Raspberry Pi 4 that was just announced. I actually meant to talk about this last week, and it was a post from a while back, but I think the segment somehow got deleted when I was importing it into Premiere. So I think it's more relevant this week anyway because of all the other stuff coming right after this. But the overview is that the new Raspberry Pi 4 was released for $35. It includes a lot of upgraded features like gigabit Ethernet, more RAM, um, and... Uh, oh, also USB 3.0, that might be relevant for certain things, but also 4K 60 HDMI output, as well as the ability to dial in exact pixel clock timings, which means that for users of uh, RGB interfaces, which may or may not be compatible, I'll get to that in a second, uh, you might actually be able to dial in a flawless recreation of the original. Now, of course, there's still going to be lag and stuff like that. It also depends on the quality of the emulation. But at least with a Raspberry Pi 4, you have the potential of presenting the same exact image that an original console or arcade board would. Um, and I'm also pretty excited about the 4K60 HDMI output. And even if it's just for things like um, watching movies with uh, CRT filters on it, um, you know, while of course, you know, seeing emulation in 4K60 is going to be cool, that way you don't have to rely on your flat screen's panel to do any of the extra scaling. Um, you know, while I'm obviously a huge fan of emulation, I'm really more interested to see what we could do with the filters and for TV shows and movies. And I know it sounds a little ridiculous, but I've done a bunch of just experimenting with using fake scan lines to watch movies that um, probably were better suited on a projector. So there were 35 millimeter rescans to Blu-ray and there's a lot of film noise in there. Um, and while, it, you know, if you use something like a 1080p or a 4K projector, it'd probably look cool. It would probably retain the original look of film. But at least in my personal opinion, on a calibrated OLED, it just looks like a noisy movie. So I experimented with putting scan lines through it and it looked great. Um, I was able to use the OSSC and uh, PS3 to dial in a setting that was pretty cool, and it got to the point where I watched half of the movie with them on, and then went back to just watching them through my Oppo Ultra HD Blu-ray player, and I missed looking at it through the fake scan lines. And that was just some, some basic ass scan lines uh, with 4K60 and the ability to have true CRT filters. So things that are really designed to mimic the look of a CRT, not just draw the horizontal lines across. I think this will be pretty neat and I'm really looking forward to seeing what we could do with stuff like this. Uh, that, of course, you know, the Raspberry Pis also have an infinite amount of, of uses for them. Uh, anytime you could imagine a tiny little computer. Um, and my first thought are things like a, a new type of NAS, uh, you know, just an infinite amount of stuff, I guess. Uh, so, anybody interested, um, links for where to buy them is in that post. But we're definitely not done with the Raspberry Pi 4 yet. A word of caution for existing owners of any kind of RGB hat or component video adapter for the Raspberry Pi. Uh, it looks like the compatibility will be spotty with the Raspberry Pi 4, at least in most hardware's current, uh, current revisions. So the RGB Pi team has already said that the Pi 4 won't be directly compatible with existing hardware, but they'll probably update the hardware to match with that. Um, and a few other people had talked about that as well. Uh, if you'd like to read the full write-up, um, you know, the link is below for Ronnie's post on summing all that stuff up. But I just think for the short term, until more Raspberry Pi 4s hit developers, I would just kind of take it as, it, you know, make it a pleasant surprise if it works, but don't count on it quite yet unless the developer has specifically said, yes, it'll work with a Pi 4. And the last bit of Raspberry Pi 4 news, the RetroArch team has said that they're going to be able to make a version of the software that's able to run your games directly off of a disc for anybody that uses CD-based games to play their emulation. Uh, that way you don't have to worry about ripping it, you could use your own original discs. Um, and they also said that the Raspberry Pi 4 is fast enough to use some of their run-ahead modes. 
Um, and I've only had a little bit of uh, experience with that, but with the Raspberry Pi 3B Plus, I think is the latest version that I've tested it on, um, you can't use the run ahead mode. It's just too slow, at least with the arcade emulation I've used. So supposedly you'll be able to use that now um, and be able to get some much lower lag solutions, which is always really exciting. Um, they also took a few shots at Polymega, which is kind of funny because I don't really think they're competing products. I think, you know, and I mean this respectfully, but I think the average person buying the Polymega doesn't want to mess around with a do-it-yourself solution. They just want something that works. Whereas the, the person that likes to tweak and mess around with stuff and constantly tinker would probably go to a Raspberry Pi solution no matter what anyway. So kind of funny. I guess whoever runs their Twitter account should probably, should probably not. I've had some run-ins with the LibRetro team before, but whatever. Uh, bottom line is that the Raspberry Pi 4 is absolutely going to be, is looking to be a game changer for emulation in that respect. Um, and while always, of course, you could build yourself a really fast PC and be able to utilize this and get better performance out of it, the whole point of something like a Raspberry Pi 4 is just having a small, easy to slap together solution and uh, that's inexpensive as well. Because while it would be fun to spend a grand on a rig that's only for old school emulation RGB outputting, you know, it's a little unrealistic for most people. Whereas dropping 100 or, you know, depending on which hat you choose, even $200 total total on everything that you would need for an awesome RGB solution using a Raspberry Pi, yeah, it's a lot more easier to swallow. But I'm excited to try it. I already pre-ordered mine and uh, you know, the moment it comes in, the first thing I'm going to do is load up arcade emulation and run ahead mode and see how that works. Some pretty big news last week, Eon had announced an S-Video to HDMI adapter for the N64. Um, and it's a little, uh, a small plastic dongle that fits right in the back of the N64 that has kind of like a foot at the back to help support for HDMI cables, not putting pressure on the multi-out. So for people that are listening audio only, I just, uh, I didn't describe it with enough justice. It's a cool looking dongle. Um, it certainly looks to be a well-made piece of equipment and the way it sits, as long as you have your N64 on a flat surface and not like hanging out the back of a shelf or anything, you won't put any extra strain on the multi-out, which is a pretty cool design. Um, they claim that it's zero lag and it's something that I obviously want to test myself because the potential is certainly there for a zero lag device like this. And I also really want to see, does it process 240p as progressive or as 480i interlaced? And what does it do for games that output 480i? How does it handle that at all? Um, so obviously there's some testing to be done to verify its claims, um, but just giving them the benefit of the doubt, the Eon team has been pretty straightforward with everything they've done. So um, I think it's safe to assume for the short term until tests are done that it is a zero lag device. And that does bring me to the price, though, which is $150. And it's something that I'm really struggling with, and I'm not really sure how I feel about it, because at $49, a plug-and-play device like this uh, would make Eon the heroes of the N64 community. Um, I'd probably recommend it as the first choice for people that need flat-screen gaming with N64, just because of how easy it is. However, at 150, I don't really know who this device is for. And I mean that respectfully. I just, you know, there's obviously the crowd out there that will just listen to a review and buy something and that's it. Um, but there's also, I think, a bigger crowd that will listen to a review and just simply type in N64 HDMI into Google and see the other solutions available out there from, you know, Bordy's board that can do VGA, component video, and RGB, all the way up to the Ultra HDMI, which, in my opinion, if you're gaming on a flat screen, it is the best, by far the best choice, because you just get every possible option you could imagine from the N64 with no lag and all that. So, um, you know, I'm wondering how bad the price is going to affect that, if at all. Because I know for me personally, even if I wasn't a retro nerd, um, being able to just do some quick Googling, find a modder that's bought a, uh, a whole bunch of Ultra HDMIs to get a discount, and be able to send my console in, it's not going to be too much more expensive than this in order to get uh, your console HDMI modded with shipping. Um, you know, pre-modded consoles are always really expensive, uh, but of course keep in mind that when you sell pre-modded consoles, there's other expenses that go with that to justify the price. 
So just mailing your N64 and, and getting it back for 250 less than that, I don't know. I think I'd probably lean more towards that. So I guess we'll find out, um, you know, maybe these things will all sell out and uh, people really do just want a plug and play adapter. I just don't know how I feel about the $150 price point yet. So I guess, you know, I just put the whole word out there, let you form your own opinions on it. Um, there's certainly a lot of people that would benefit from just being able to plug this thing in and playing it on flat screens. So we'll see once testing is done. Uh, and the only other thing to mention is at the moment it's NTSC only. And I'm assuming that's because not all PAL N64s work properly with S-Video. Some would require a mod kind of defeating the purpose of something like this. Um, I believe Eon said that they were going to have a PAL version soon, which I would assume is a composite video to HDMI converter as opposed to S-Video. But once again, I'd like to test these first. So uh, check out the post if you're interested. Um, and uh, I'll really, I think Castlemania Games has them up for pre-order now. And as soon as I get one in, even if I don't have time to do a full video, at the very least, I'll post on Twitter or Instagram or, or even just a, a short post on the site with a, a very quick video just, uh, showing how it's processing the, the, foot or the video and if there's any latency at all. I recently posted an interview with Rourke from Rourke's Retro Corner, and uh, man, that was a cool one. I was absolutely fascinated by how he makes the molds for these Game Boy cases that he sells or will be selling. Um, and, and I mean, the guy is just top notch at his work. So anybody that's interested in Game Boy or Retro or just, you know, listening to an awesome story about somebody that figures this stuff out by themselves and comes out with some pretty incredible products, please give it a listen. Um, I'm certainly excited with uh, about everything that he's working on and I'll definitely keep everybody updated anytime there's a cool new project or something else you could buy from him. Undamned just finished another project that is helping save all of our arcade boards. Uh, he now has come out with a CPS-1 de-suicide board. So essentially what that means is a, a lot of the old Capcom arcade systems, the Capcom Play System 2 for example, uh, under certain scenarios it would be completely bricked, which they would call it suiciding, and for a while there was no way to bring them back. Um, and with about a year ago, uh, a solution had uh, been completed that allows you to both resurrect these boards or put different pieces of hardware in them to prevent them from ever going bad. Um, up until now, that was only available on the CPS-2, but now Undam Undamned is working on both the CPS-1 as well as the CPS-1.5 that has the just those few uh, Q-type games, just the, the small handful of them. So it's a, one of these things where it's... It's just such an unbelievably important project because I can't even imagine how many CPS 1 and 2 boards have been sitting in a closet somewhere broken for years because of this, and now they could all be used again. So, uh, you know, thanks very much for his work, and anybody that wants to check it out, uh, please follow the link and definitely pick one up if you have a CPS 1 board. Dragon City has just announced they'll be selling their own version of the Dreamcast and Saturn PSU kits. I believe they're available now, and I guess it's a good alternative for people that had needed one from the other project that ended up falling apart. Uh, so if you need one of these, check it out and see if it's for you. And I, I would like to ask, though, um, I don't really have much experience with these, and I'm not really sure the main purpose of that. I mean that respectfully, of course, but... So obviously, if the power supply in your Dreamcast dies, you have the you know you have the choice of trying to replace components on it and repair it, or dropping in a replacement. So that makes sense. And there's also certain mods that would be better if there were more room in, uh, available inside the console. Um, so I get that too. But what's the other scenarios in which that people would want to swap these over? Is it simply removing the AC to DC converter out to a brick to save both heat and efficiency? Um, I guess, you know, if, if anybody was, was planning on commenting anyway, uh, you know, maybe give a quick blurb about why you would want something like this. Because for me, it would really just be, I wouldn't use it as a preventative measure. I would need a specific reason that I would want to put a small PSU into one of these. But interested in hearing what people have to say. It looks like the production of the Framemeister has officially ended, and I don't believe they have an official replacement announced, but there are rumors that something will be happening. Um, and to be honest, I, I think that's okay. I think the Framemeister certainly ran its course, did exactly uh, you know what it, it was supposed to do, 
And in my opinion, it's still probably the best option for your average streamer that's willing to dump the cash on it. <laughs> I think that's the only thing still, uh, still keeping it um, from, for keeping me from calling it the best solution for streamers, because it is still a very expensive solution. But it is a device where you could plug in any console, whether it's composite, S-Video, RGB, whatever, and then download the Firebrand X profiles and get yourself an HDMI output that's compatible with, I think, every capture card. Um, and looks absolutely great on stream. Any of the, the pros probably don't use it because uh, they like to use direct RGB without any color compression, uh, use things like the OSSC and all that. But I, I think that if you're a serious streamer that, you know, it, right in that middle to, to high end level, this is still probably your best bet. But other than that, for just gamers, I still prefer the OSSC. And at the end of the day, you can get the OSSC and the RetroTINK for about the same price as a FrameMeister. So if you need the extra inputs or if you need guaranteed compatibility, that's certainly, uh, you know, I would personally recommend both of those for gaming over the FrameMeister, especially because both of those are zero lag. So I don't know, it's the end of an era. It certainly changed the game for uh, playing retro on a flat screen. Um, and it, it, made, it, it made an existing or a forever lasting mark on history, I guess because there certainly was nothing before it that did what it did. So um, I'm not happy to see it end, but I'm, I'm happy to see it run its course and have new th and better things replace it. And hopefully by the end of the year, we'll have just that. So I'll keep people updated if uh, as soon as there's any word. And I just wouldn't recommend running out to eBay and buying a super expensive one now. I think there's other choices out there for everybody. Um, you know, except that one niche of streamers that really just want to be able to use those tweaked profiles. It looks like the Commodore 64 is getting re-released as a full-sized emulation console. I guess with the success of the Commodore 64 Mini, a group of people realized that people wanted a full-sized version of this. They wanted to be able to utilize the keyboard um, and, and have a solution that felt more like the original. So this team has set out to make one that is fully functional and outputs 720p HDMI as well as having USB ports for controllers. It'll come with 64 games, I'm sure that's not an accident, um, and will be available this December, but there's no word on pricing. So I think pricing is going to be an important factor in this, because while I would have loved to have seen an FPGA Commodore 64 that outputs all of the analog outputs as well as HDMI, if this is cheap enough and a decent enough emulation solution, it'll still be good. So I'm sure you can count on one of us reviewing, uh, reviewing it as soon as it's released, and uh, I don't know, it seems pretty neat. I'm just glad a lot of these old consoles are getting the love that they deserve. I just hope it's more of a, um, a true to the original experience and not just a cash grab like the PlayStation Classic. I recently talked about how the Japanese release of the Mega Drive Mini will also have an option that has a mini tower of power with it, the Mega CD, the 32X, and of course the original Mega Drive. And while they're non-functioning, I really loved the idea of that. Uh, and it looks like there will also be a collector's edition that comes with a bunch of non-working games that are just mini Mega Drive games with the same artwork that don't work but look pretty awesome. Um, and I love it. Uh, you know, I don't have room to collect a lot of stuff, even though I would like to. Um, but the few things I do have specifically for the, re you know, just because I want it, I don't actually use it. You know, they're important to me and I like them. And I think I might have to get this one as well because it just, it looks so neat. I'll be leaving off the 32X because as you all know, I hate the way that thing looks. <laughs> but I just think of having a bunch of, uh, of neat fake little cartridges with a Sega CD and Genesis on it is just such an awesome little collector's item. And I think it would be hilarious to have that displayed on my shelf. The DisplayPort 2.0 standard was just published, and it's going to support 8K resolutions and above, as well as have advantages for augmented reality, virtual reality, and different ways of transferring information through USB-C connections. So while this isn't directly related to retro gaming, there are so many of us that are either content creators or just hardcore nerds with the best setups. Uh, I just feel like it was worth mentioning um, and just something to keep in the back of your mind if you're somehow going to 8K right now. Uh, not really sure how easy that is to do. I don't think there's many choices, but hey, whatever. I'm sure there's at least somebody out there trying to stick on the forefront of all this stuff. Sega Genesis developer Sick the Hedgehog has just announced a new game called Arcagus Revolution 
that is, he's calling a Mode 7 style shooter for the Genesis. Um, in the video shown here, it does look like uh, there's rotation and scaling done just like the Super Nintendo's Mode 7. Uh, and I'm really not sure how that's even possible. So it's, it's still pretty incredible to me that people all of these years later are finding ways to just squeeze every ounce of power and enhancements out of original hardware. Um, so I'm certainly going to be playing this one as soon as it's released, even if it's just to see how the heck he does it and, uh, and how good it looks compared to other stuff. But it's certainly very impressive looking based on the tweet. The series One Punch Man is now getting made into a 3 vs 3 fighting game. And I'll admit, I didn't know what One Punch Man was until I read Ray's article on it. Uh, but much like High Score Girl, after reading through the whole article, I was completely sold. So I haven't had time to go and check out the series yet, but it seems like it's going to be a cool game. And anybody even remotely interested in this, please give Ray's article a read. I thought it was really awesome, and uh, it shined light on a series that I think I'd probably enjoy. So definitely check that out. Artemio has just launched the MD Fourier Audio Preservation Project, which is centered around capturing audio samples from original consoles so that people will be able to retain the exact sound with measurable data to, uh, to compare it against. Um, I was helping out test some Sega Genesis consoles, and the Genesis is the first console that Artemio is supporting. Um, and what we did was use a very specific um, group of equipment so that there's no external factors involved in skewing the results. And we took audio samples using the MD Fourier program that Artemio created that sends a specific set of tones and noises through the Genesis. So we're able to capture this audio and then use the computer software that Artemio made to compare it against any other captures. And the specific part of the puzzle that I was helping out with was being able to make the next version of the Triple Bypass sound identical to the original. Um, this is something where we were lucky enough to have Ace and Firebrand X help us out with, but at the end of the day, we were relying on their very fine-tuned ears in order to get these measurements and figure it out. And now it completely takes the guesswork away. We just play these tones through original Genesis consoles, which is why I reached out on Twitter a few weeks ago to, to see. And thank you so much to the people that sent stuff over because I've tested all of those now. Um, so we're going to test those. Uh, we've also going to do some more experiments on testing different things. And now when the next revision of the Triple Bypass comes out, it'll be slightly tweaked in that everything should be equal to the original. So of course you can't get the different YM audio chip in a Genesis 2 or 3, that will never change. But things like uh, on stock unmodified consoles right now, when you're playing Sonic the Hedgehog, the rings are louder on some consoles than others. And some of that's a direct result of Sega's quality not always being consistent. Um, so from a hardware perspective, now the next version of the Triple Bypass will even that out on all models. Uh, but to be honest, this project is way bigger than just something like the Triple Bypass. The other research we're doing and the same captures that we have could also potentially lead to projects like the Mr. Project or maybe even Kevtris being able to add modes in the FPGA emulation where you could actually select, I want it to sound like a VA3 Genesis 1, I want it to sound like a VA2 Genesis 2. And there's even potential in there for software emulation to be able to do stuff like, you know, you have your childhood console that's still in good condition. So you run the audio test through that, run the audio test through the software emulation and have it automatically match it. Now, none of those last things exist yet. This is all my wishful thinking and speculation, but it's all absolutely plausible. And it's all routed in making sure that we get really good captures of this. So if you're interested in doing it yourself, I put together a video. When I shot the video, it was in the context of testing for the Triple Bypass project and stuff like this. Uh, but to be honest, it could be applied to anything. And while I'm pretty sure we have all the captures we need, um, now you'll be able to see for yourself uh, how to compare two Genesis consoles. And you might even be able to help tweak. So maybe you already have a Mega SG and you could mess with some of the settings till you get it like an original. And maybe even stuff like, um, on Genesis consoles with aging capacitors. Not blown out leaking capacitors, we know those won't work right, but I wonder what'll happen if you do a full cap replacement with really high quality, um, you know, the lowest tolerance feasibly possible, and, and do you get different audio changes there? Is it better or worse? 
now we could take measurements of all of that stuff. So this is a huge step towards um, really archiving how these consoles should sound. And Artemio said he'll eventually move over to other consoles and probably implement this directly into the 240p test suite at some point. But I'm just really excited because this is now a blueprint for anybody in the future who wants to recreate the exact sound of these consoles long before or long after the consoles have uh, reached the course of their lives. So it's, uh, you know, there's still time while they're 30 years old, there's still many consoles in really great condition. So we could do all of these captures and, uh, and go from there. And once again, you don't need all of the equipment that I show in the video and link to, but in a lot of the testing that I've done and making the videos that I've been making, I've just run into so many issues in audio capture and there's always some noise and something. So at the very least, we've been able to nail down very affordable, all things considered, hardware and cables and stuff that would allow anybody to do this in any environment. You know, just a specific USB capture card, powered hub, a bunch of shielded cables really is essentially all it is. Uh, so. If you're interested, please check it out. And as always, thanks so much to our team EO and the entire Triple Bypass team for working on all this stuff. Because, you know, even though m not everybody understands all, of, all the crap that we're doing, I think everybody will benefit from it at the end of the day. So thank you to the whole team. A new game was just announced that looks like it was either inspired by or maybe even a spiritual successor to Act Razor. The game is called Soul Seraph, I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong, um, and it's going to be available this month for uh, all major platforms, PS4, Xbox One, Switch, and PC, and it looks really cool. Uh, it even has music from Yuzu, Yuzo Koshiro, once again, I'm so sorry for my pronunciations, uh, and it looks absolutely awesome. There's a great trailer out there, uh, and Ray did an awesome article on this comparing it to ActRaiser. Uh, and kind of putting everything into perspective. So if you like that style of game uh, and you're interested in it, please check this out. And uh, the official release date is July 10th for $15. Unfortunately, it's digital only, but uh, it just looks like an awesome game. So whatever, any way you can get it, get it. Greg Collins has just released a 3D printed LCD mount for the Sega Nomad. Uh, people that are doing things like the LCD driver or just putting a composite video screen in would previously have had to glue in a screen somehow. Um, and, you know, that always has a bunch of problems of its own. You could use hot glue, which at least is reversible, but would eventually dry up and possibly fall out. You could epoxy it, and that's never going anywhere, for better or worse. So now Greg's come up with a solution that allows you to mount either the LCD driver or I believe even the composite video uh, LCD screen that people have been using and mount it in safely without any glue being needed. So uh, it's a pretty awesome thing for people with Nomads and there's actually a bunch of cool mods coming out for the Nomad this year. So uh, I'm really interested in it myself. Um, I I'll find another Nomad one of these days and do all these things to it just because it's, you know, it's such a neat console. I remember when it was first released, you know, just my mind was blown that it was like a Game Gear, but could play real Genesis games. And I've owned a few over time and had to buy and sell for whatever reason. Uh, and I gotta say that this, at least in my opinion, the screens never aged well at all. So the fact that there's really good LCD screen replacements and now a 3D printed mount that allows you to fix it without using hot glue is even better. So as always, anything uh, that Greg makes can be purchased through laserbear.net. And he also has provided the 3D printed design files for anybody that wants to try to print it themselves. A while back I talked about Virtua Racing and its new release on the Nintendo Switch and I wanted to update that original post as it's now available to purchase on the US Nintendo Switch store, not just the Japanese store. And on top of that, uh, Genovi just posted an updated review of the game as well as the video that he had on it I think a year or two ago. So I updated the original post because I think the DF Retro review and Genovi's re reviews still stand. Uh, the only difference is it's now available uh, in the U.S. as well as just Japan. So, you know, I, I bought it and I played it for just a few moments and I could already tell it's as good as everybody says it is. So if you love the game like I did when I was a kid, and uh, you know, even if you already bought it, I would recommend watching all of these videos because even though you already know it and you could already see it, it certainly gives you a different 
different sense of what you're playing. And at least for me, it makes me appreciate the newer version even more because not just the side-by-sides, but really the detail that's gone into describing all of the different versions is pretty awesome. So uh, just check out that main post. All of the videos are embedded in as well as a link directly to where to buy it from the US Nintendo store. Voltar just posted a video on how he installed the Game Boy Advance consoleizer, and it's a typical Voltar video. It's a lot of fun to watch, uh, filled with awesome solder porn, and it shows you a really great installation method for this kit. So please check it out if you're interested in this at all. And if you're not fully familiar with the Game Boy Advance consoleizer, in the same post I embedded the video I did last year that has pretty much every detail you could ever imagine, as well as like a little mini history of Game Boy on TV. Ben Abresh posted instructions for people that are, might be having issues with the Noctua fan fitting inside their Dreamcast. And I've installed a bunch of these in different Dreamcasts, and I had never really had any issues, but I've heard a few people contact me after seeing my tips and tricks video saying that they had issues getting it to fit. So I don't know if there's a certain type of case or something where there might be a few issues. Uh, and if you run into that problem, then definitely check out Ben's post and go through and see if some of the same fixes will work for you. Um, overall though, it just, it's significantly quieter than the original fan. And while I haven't done very hardcore thermal testing on this, it definitely seems to be keeping the temperature of the console down more than the stock fan did. So I, it's one that I definitely would recommend for big Dreamcast fans that want to put a lot of use into their consoles. So uh, if you're interested, please check this out. And once again, I'd buy this anyway. Even if you do end up with one of the models with some issues, you could just kind of trim out the 3D print a little bit to make it fit. So certainly anything that, uh, that runs cooler and more efficiently will be better in the long run. Modern Vintage Gamer just posted a video in which he was able to port Diablo to the Switch without the source code. Uh, and it's a pretty awesome video, and anybody that's even remotely interested in that should give it a watch. And if you're not familiar with Modern Vintage Gamer and the work that he does, um, he does a lot of the behind-the-scenes stuff and videos. Um, and I got to admit, you know, maybe this is a mean thing to say, but sometimes it's a little annoying that I'll see him come out with something and he talks about it and he's talking about the thing that he actually made. And then you'll see YouTubers pop up now and then talking about it in the same way that you always do. Anytime something's announced, there's 10,000 speculation videos of it. But then there's some other random person talking about this, you know, Diablo's ported to the Switch as if they had something to do with it and they didn't. So... Uh, I certainly am not trying to be negative or talk shit or anything, but it just cracks me up that here's a popular YouTuber that also does all the behind the scenes work. Um, and I just, I see people talk about his stuff sometimes without, maybe they themselves don't even realize that he was the one that did the hard work behind the scenes. So shout out to Modern Vintage Gamer for all the awesome stuff that he does. Definitely check out the video and uh, I hope nobody was too offended by my shitting on the uh, speculation YouTubers. <laughs> well, that's it for this week. Just a heads up that I'll be in California next week, so something's going to be different about the podcast. I'm not sure if I'll do it out there or if I'll ask somebody to fill in or a combination of both, but I just wanted to give everybody a heads up that something's going to be different next week, but I'm sure it'll all fall into place. And as always, thank you to everybody who watches and listens and comments and keeps it nice in the comments. And of course, everybody who supports because none of these videos could be made without any of your support. So thank you so much. And I or one of the team will see you next week.